Hello everyone and welcome back finally to another episode of Planet Zookeeper which is where I give my tips and tricks as a zookeeper to make your zoos look more realistic. Um, this episode we will be talking all about using terrain and rocks, um, incorporating terrain painting as well as elevation and uh, yeah, everything to do with rocks and things like that as well. So if you have been struggling with how to make your terrain and rock work look more realistic, then hopefully this will be the video for you. Right everyone, so we've made it to episode four. So if you haven't already seen previous episodes, then I will uh, link to the playlist of Planet Zookeeper down below. Um, we've done fencing, which we did in the first episode. Episode two was planting. In the last one, we talked about layouts and zoo maps um, in episode three. And this week in episode four, we will be talking about terrain and rock work. So um, we will be covering terrain painting. Um, we will cover rocks um, as a whole. And then we will also talk about elevation of uh, of terrain with regards to sort of general areas and general um, aspects as well as to do with enclosures more specifically. So we will dive straight in with our terrain painting. So obviously we have got a variety of different terrain paints in the game um, which I have laid out here. I've split short and long grass because they are fairly big topics and then the other three that have a couple of types I've put um, together. So short grass. So short grass obviously is going to be quite a common one for your zoos um, both within enclosures themselves as well as in just general public areas. Um, so within enclosures you're probably going to get short grass especially in herbivore enclosures where the grass has been grazed down by the animals inside. Um, you might get areas where it's been worn down but still still poking through not enough to be soil but still uh, just very short grass that's worn down as well in some enclosures. Um, you would also get areas where grass has actually been mown so that it's uh, it's not too long. So within enclosures that might be to improve viewing for the public of the animals themselves especially if you've got small animals that can't be seen in long grass. Um, and you'll also get mown grass in public areas of course, so things like um, just grass lawns, um, you might have picnic areas and things where it's grass that's just uh, kept short and tidy, um, and just general other areas that might have been mowed um, to keep them a bit more tidy. So if you want to go for a, a tidier, more maintained look, then um, short grass might be the one that you're looking for. Um, it's unfortunate really that we don't have a mixture, um, or not, not necessarily a mixture, but just a kind of in-between version of these two, because the long grass is quite long, but um, yeah, it's a shame we don't have a slightly shorter um, version of this, uh, this actual grass, but um, we make do with what we've got. So moving on to long grass, so also this one going to be very common in your enclosures as well as public areas. So as opposed to the more tidy maintained look of the short grass if you want a bit more of a natural look a bit more unkept um, then this will probably be something that you would use a little bit more um, within the enclosures themselves it's going to be fairly prominent in any non-grazing animals in particular so things like carnivores um, or omnivores that aren't really going to be eating the grass then you're more likely to have this um, this longer grass coming through. Um, you you may have some in certain grazed uh, grazing animal habitats um, but that will depend on a few different factors so one being the size of the enclosure so if you have a very large enclosure with only a few animals in it then you will probably more likely have some longer patches of grass in there that the um, the animals maybe haven't had a chance to eat it all down and can't keep up with it. 
um, the number of animals will be a big factor so if you have got um, a lot of animals um, especially in a small space then they will be eating all the grass down as much as they can whereas if you have a couple in a large field then you may have more patches of longer grass there and then also also the uh, the traversable area and things like that so if there's any areas that maybe the animals can't get to as well or they're fenced off slightly um, and potentially sometimes the, the very edges of enclosures where the animals maybe don't bother going right up to the fence to, to graze that bit um, then they are patches where you may have some longer grass within your enclosures as well. In terms of the actual general zoo um, in public areas and things like that you may want some longer grass in just less maintained areas um, you might have more kind of nature areas that you want to keep the grass longer and have maybe some wildflowers or something in there as well. Um, you might have some fields and things um, within your zoo potentially. Um, and you will also probably have some off-show areas, some backstage keeper areas that aren't as maintained that maybe have some longer grass in patches as well. You will probably find with these two there might be an impact depending on the kind of size of zoo you're going for and the style so if you have a smaller city zoo or something like that you'll probably be less likely to have a lot of big areas of long grass you're more likely to have more well maintained um, areas of shorter grass, mown grass um, and you will have less free space in general to just have large areas of grass you probably want to cram as much as you can in a, uh, a sh smaller zoo in a, in a small space so um, the size of the zoo that you're building will probably have an impact as well. So we'll move now over to soil. So soil as well is a useful paint um, with a useful terrain paint that we've got here. Um, it's another very common one that we will see quite a lot in zoos. So it's really good for a number of things so you can use it, the one that I would use it the most for, would be marking out areas that are a bit more worn, either by animals within enclosures as well as potentially guests as well, um, implied of course because they can't walk off of paths, but um, just areas that are a bit more worn down that have a bit more traffic going over them. So um, in terms of visitors, you may just have, um, for example, a corner here if this was a guest path you're probably going to get people walking across here um, as a little shortcut instead of following the path all the way around so you maybe would just want to put a, a faint bit of soil across there to show that the grass has been worn down by people cutting across the corner um, and then within enclosures animals will often make certain pathways they'll have certain routes that they follow within their enclosure and kind of stick to them to an extent um, because it's easier to, to walk um, a certain route than to constantly be walking through long grass. Um, all, all people, all animals tend to do that sort of thing um, in, uh, in more difficult terrain and things like that. So you're, you're probably going to get these areas that animals follow as tracks. Um, you will also get them around sort of entrances and exits. So if you have um, your house on this side and you had um, your paddock over here the area right outside the gate um, the entrance and exit to the house or yard or wherever you're you're looking at is going to have a lot more traffic a lot more feet walking over it every day and those patches there where you've got gates and doorways and things are likely to have more wear and tear on them so be more more muddy more soil um, you will have areas probably around water that will get a bit more worn because the water sort of um, means that any feet that do go on it maybe destroy the grass a bit more and um, that's, that's often the case. Um, you will also have areas where you've got a lot of trees that get a lot less light and things like that. You might find that you won't have as much grass so um, those patches under there might be more soil based. And then you will also have areas that are just actually planted. So you might have areas, more maintained areas, flower beds, things like that, that are planted up um, that you might want to put a base of soil in um, rather than grass, just to show that they're maintained. They, they try and weed it. They keep it all fresh, keep it all soiled so that they have specific plants growing in there. 
but I must say that I often will use the mulch for those sorts of areas instead within the plant tab um, which kind of acts as another version of soil but obviously it just means that you have to place it rather than paint it um, which can be a bit more tricky um, but yeah in general planted areas you'll often find the base being soil moving on to rock so rock I personally would say isn't as useful on its own as a lot of the others um, I would I would opt more probably to use it in conjunction with actual rocks um, because you generally find it's kind of more use rock wise for like cladding and features and things like that rather than having really big large expanses of rock within your zoo that you just want to to color like this so yeah I personally wouldn't really recommend using a huge amount of this unless you're using it in conjunction with actual rocks um, it just doesn't really look that realistic I would say even though the textures themselves are quite nice um, so we move to sand so sand is commonly used um, in zoos often as a, a certain substrate so when we talk about substrate we talk about kind of bedding or just whatever mater material is on the floor basically um, so you might have bedding flooring um, being sand um, it could be used in yard areas or sometimes indoor areas um, artificial man-made areas so uh, a lot of the time you maybe find things like elephant houses will have sand on the floor so you could you could have terrain floor and paint it in sand to to suggest that um, a lot of zoos will also use sand soil maybe a mixture um, without any grass at all in the uh, in the enclosures so um, this might be as a way to control the grazing or feeding by certain herbivore species to to make sure you can control exactly what they're getting not have them get overweight because they've got so much grass and um, things like that so you might want a mixture of kind of sandy dusty soil um, based for your whole enclosure um, and then we'll also find a lot of the time certain species in particular things like equine animals so the zebras and things like that um, the elephant, various different species, ostrich as well, things like that, will have actual dust baths um, that will often be sand for the animals to roll in and and uh, kind of clean themselves, try and get rid of parasites and all that sort of thing that they would use that for, or enrichment piles as well. So maybe you're able to bury food in there and encourage animals to sort of dig for their food, that sort of thing. So um, just having small little piles or patches of sand can be a, a useful one to suggest dust baths or enrichment um, items and the last one of course is snow which is incredibly bright there um, so again quite uncommon as a terrain option within zoos so you may find the odd indoor area um, would have a snow snowy substrate on the floor for certain species so a lot of the time we'll be thinking about penguins things like that depending on the species of course if they're cold weather um, but again this is very expensive to maintain so um, it would be used pretty sparingly um, I would say um, because you're unlikely to be able to maintain that and of course outside you're definitely not going to be able to maintain that even though we have got these coolers that we can place down in the game so outdoors meaning then it's quite unlikely to have that um, except as an actual weather element so when the when it snows in game you'll you will have snow on the ground but um, permanent snow like that as, as a general thing is very unlikely um, the only other thing that they may be, you may be able to use it for is certain aspects of theming so if you wanted a kind of fake mountain with snow snow caps on it then that might be something that you would like to incorporate there we will now move just over briefly to an example um, little enclosure here for our little doll sheep um, this is not incorporating all of those aspects but just a few just to give an idea so um, within here you can see a few of the elements so we've got um, a few little patches of longer grass but 
something like that would probably eat the grass so you're probably going to have not even as much long grass as this to be honest um, and then some patches of shorter grass we've got some areas of soil so we've got these pathways that the animals use a lot um, we've got an area around the water trough there that's more well trodden as well so certain features like that might have um, a bit more similar to as I said entrances and exits might have more of this kind of worn um, terrain underneath there and then over here we have got the rock so um, here we have used a combination as I said so we've got some actual rocks here um, as you can see in this terrain and then we've used the terrain itself to to bring sort of increase to elevate it and um, paint it in rock just to kind of merge it all in there um, so that is more realistic way of, of um, using the rock I'd probably say um, and then again we've got our entrance exit to the enclosure having a bit more soil there as it's been worn down a bit more so these are the kind of things that I mean by uh, by what I've discussed over there these kind of aspects there for, for your animals and obviously as I said various different things will affect this the size the number of animals all of that sort of thing the animal itself what what kind of aesthetic you're going for things like that but um, yeah there's there's a few examples there so next we will move over to rocks so rock wise we've probably going to split it into artificial and natural that's how I've decided to split them um, and that is kind of accentuated even more now by the fact that we have got these artificial rocks um, in the aquatic pack so if you haven't already got them then these will be a very useful one for you um, so we will discuss these two different types so artificial rocks just realized we're not actually in play so you can't see these animals moving around so um, artificial rocks are very common in zoos um, used to a varying extent though depending on the zoos um, the enclosure the aesthetic all of those sorts of things so some zoos will, will have heavy use of them in multiple enclosures some might use them quite sparsely um, uh, then there's a number of different uses and different ways they might be uh, might be incorporated into enclosures so um, you can see a couple of them here so we've got backdrops and walls um, so here we've kind of covered the whole of the back and side of this enclosure with the rock um, they can be used with water in conjunction with water so here we've got a kind of pool made out of this artificial rock um, they can be um, incorporated into maybe feeding elements things like that um, if you wanted little holes and things for for animals to kind of poke into that sort of thing um, we could have heated rocks that might be kind of fake designed to look like rocks so these sort of flatter rocks um, could in theory maybe be heated um, if this was um, a different enclosure maybe not as much for a snow leopard but if this was a lion enclosure and you had a heated rock there that could be an option um, and things like shelter bedding they might be used for as well so if we had a kind of more cover over this um, they could be used for that and then of course actual barriers themselves between enclosures between um, uh, sight lines things like that just to, to actually block views and things like that generally the reason for using them would be to improve the theming um, so more aesthetic reasons so just because it looks maybe nicer um, and yeah allows you to theme your enclosures a bit more depending on the the biome and the animal that's in there the as I said the new artificial set that we've got here is really good for this it looks very much fake but realistic to realistic fake is what I, I would like to say um, they are so they look good but they do look fake and that's kind of what we want to make a realistic looking zoo because the artificial rock in a lot of zoos does look fake so um, the fact that it's flexi color as well is very good so you can use these rocks for any different kind of enclosure and any style any theming um, any biome so this one we've kind of got more grey rocks to 
fit a bit better with the snow leopard but you might have more sandy colour rocks and you might have more desert themed um, ideas you might make it similar to the red rock for the Australian um, pack animals things like that so very flexible um, but if, if you don't have this you can still use the, the standard sets that we've got the standard rock sets in a similar kind of way to uh, to make them look a bit more artificial and to use them for all those um, reasons that I just mentioned that uh, artificial rock might be used so in some ways it depends on the way you do them and the design of them that will make them look more fake or more natural which we will now discuss so in here we've got our lovely giant panda it's a very tiny enclosure I must say so it can't move around too much but this is purely just for show um, so here I've used the standard rock sets so the the natural rocks um, I guess we should call them now so um, these can be used to look natural as well as artificial um, so these guys probably look you're not going to want them to use them to look realistic you're going to want them to look fake because it's a zoo rather than to look realistic so these guys are the ones you're probably going to want to use if you want these rocks to look natural um, but as I said you can probably use these as well to look artificial as well so one of the things that's quite important to think about is the placement of them um, so not having maybe too many not overdoing it um, but it does depend a lot on your landscape, um, your setting, wherever your zoo is supposed to be, and the general design of your zoo. Is it based in a very rocky area, or is it more of a grassland where you're going to have less rocks, things like that. Um, so those are all things that you might want to think about. Um, use them a bit more sparingly, probably, unless you're in an incredibly rocky area, and that's your, your kind of story. Um, so here we've just dotted a few about, we haven't gone overboard, we haven't made the whole of this rock because um, that's not as natural. Um, use them in conjunction with other elements, so the planting is a big one. So um, if you want them to look more realistic, have little bits of plants sticking out, have um, your kind of areas surrounded being covered up by plants, um, just kind of blend them in a lot more with, with the planting. Um, instead of having this sort of thing where they just stick out like a sore thumb. Um, that is one, one way of making them look more natural in general. You can combine them with the terrain um, as well, so making maybe if you've got a hill but there's a, a, a more steep bit and that's where you want some rock to, to make out as if there's kind of been some wearing away of the, the landscape and some rocks exposed that sort of aspect um, and then you can also obviously incorporate them with things like cliffs so here we've, we've kind of gone for a bit more of a cliffy aspect um, we probably if we wanted it to look more natural would have had terrain up here um, as I said there to make it look like this is all worn down just uh, just using bits of terrain um, or using the, the rock painting to make them look a bit more natural potentially um, you might have them around water, things like that, and and then as I said, just random, random rocks dotted about, but not too many. So you might just have a random bowl that, that over there, um, or the zoos put an actual real rock in there to um, make it look a bit nicer and planted up around it. So um, I hope you would agree that this looks a bit more natural than this, um, but that is the idea. So next we will move over to general elevation techniques um, and examples. So one of the things is hiding things. So terrain can be used to hide various different things. So you might want to hide a building. So we've got a keeper's hut there. And if you, I was a member of the public down here, um, walking along I obviously would not see it because there is a big hill in the way so that might be a conscious thing um, that the zoo has done they they might have cut out this little area here um, dug it all away so that this can be built here and they know that it's going to be off show um, general off show areas might be used for as well so you might have a kind of yard area or storage area just anywhere that you want to hide stuff um, 
that rather than using a fence you actually use the terrain itself um, then you may also use them so you, you could use things like hills but you could also have certain cutouts in the terrain um, as we've done here uh, you might have sunken areas that, that will kind of keep things a bit more hidden away out of view um, as opposed to bits raised up in front of things next we'll move to natural variation so we've got some lovely aquatic pack animals here we've got the penguins thought I would add them in so natural variation so it's very rare that you'll get very large areas of land that's completely flat um, especially if you've got yeah if you've got very large areas so in short short areas or small areas sorry um, you may have have more flat um, aspect but if you've got a whole zoo it's unlikely the whole zoo is going to be flat so you do want just natural variation so um, you might want some some sort of gradual slopes um, you can kind of vary it so um, just trying to keep the natural kind of undulating terrain there so you might have some very gradual you might have some a bit more extreme and you might have a slightly steeper slope in other places things like that um, but yeah just just in general the idea to make it not completely flat um, a good way to do it if you're not too familiar with the the roughen tool which I have found quite useful in uh, in a lot of cases especially over a larger area um, but you may want the intensity right down potentially is that this if you click it it moves terrain around it just adds little hills little dips things like that so if you wanted to effectively drag that all the way across your map um, it will give you if you can kind of see there it will give you just slightly more natural slopes um, and you of course can then um, you can increase that and make it very very pronounced um, and you can do that to your whole map and you'll kind of have um, a more interesting terrain uh, map you can then cut things out like we've done here you could cut that out and put a building there and say that that's been dug out for the building all sorts of things so that's quite a good tool if you're not as keen on doing a huge amount of terrain work yourself with the push and pull and all those sorts of um, different tools there so um, yeah natural variation very important just to make your zoo look a bit more alive um, and just to kind of yeah just to just to make it a bit more interesting in a way so next we've got focal points and views so you can use the terrain particularly if you've got elevated areas to create certain viewpoints um, from the zoo so you can create certain aesthetics you might want your zoo to be on a mountain so you will have um, a large ditch or all the way around your zoo and, and you can then uh, have the option to design certain things from the outside so that you've got a lovely view from your zoo things like that um, you might want to use it to draw the eye to certain areas um, using elevated terrain so you might have like a gorge that goes through the middle of your zoo that you want people to see from a bridge or that sort of thing or you maybe will use hills to obscure certain views so that people's eyes are drawn to certain other aspects so um, terrain can be used to create certain focal points or, or to have views out over things or you might have a mountain in the background that you want people to be looking up at uh, all sorts of different options there but just things that you can use the terrain for and finally features so where there we've used the terrain to uh, not as the main feature but to draw the eye to other things this is um, talking more about using terrain as a, a feature and drawing the eye to the, the terrain that you've uh, manipulated so you might have big hills you might have mountains um, if you wanted um, like we've got here a little snow capped mountain <laughs> miniature version uh, you might have a big waterfall that obviously comes off of the high area that um, down to the low area you could have ditches or valleys things like that and of course all of these things could be within enclosures 
or in the general zoo or even outside the boundaries of the zoo if you wanted to go as far as to um, manipulate terrain and, and actually design things for outside of your zoo as we talked about in the maps and layout section um, in the episode. So next we move to enclosures. So um, this is one we mentioned in the uh, a fencing episode as you can see the enclosure there behind um, so this is obviously a terrain based fencing technique so it basically involves using a dry moat which you can see here um, combined with a shorter public fence to allow a kind of unobscured fenceless view of the animals um, but on the same level as the guests so instead of having a ditch here and the animals are down in the ditch. Um, you can, or, or having a um, having everything at the same level, but having to look through a fence, you can have obscured views of the animal, but on the same level. So that is the idea of the ha ha or the dry moat. Um, fairly common for hoof stock things like that, um, but also used for other things depending on the the level of uh, of the ditch, effectively, and how much. Um, attention you're paying to this barrier here um, on the inside. Um, you can have a very short fence there as long as you have a very tall fence um, going down that side for a bit if you have more dangerous animals in there and you'll need electric all sorts of things so um, fairly easy to do for hoof stock but not as much for more complicated um, species and more dangerous species. Next we've got pit um, I was trying to think of a nicer word to describe these but I can't really so um, pits are very much a more old-fashioned technique and design so a lot of the time in the past animals were kept in these kind of pit style enclosures so bears are one of the classic ones obviously hard to keep in quite just can be quite destructive so they were put in these pits um, to keep them in and for people to be able to look down on them and see them very well all the time. Um, so, yeah, as I say, a more, a bit more of an outdated design, but it can be used to um, to make things look look good, and uh, can be used successfully in some situations. But you have to be very careful, obviously, how you do it. Um, you, you. It basically means that your whole enclosure is lower than the public. That is that's kind of the idea of it. Um, so public are up here, not necessarily all the way around, maybe just on this side, but the whole everything within the enclosure is lower down than the public, um, uh, but built all the, completely into the ground. So it's not just an elevated walkway for the public. So that's one way of doing it nicely, but still having people looking down on on the animals would be to have an elevated walkway rather than the animals just in a pit um, but yeah if if you're going for a more old-fashioned looking zoo if that's kind of the aesthetic you're going for something that's been renovated you maybe would incorporate something like this so our next um, topic is carved out so um, this is where you have an enclosure carved out of some sort of area of higher elevation to match the public level. So here you would imagine that all the surrounding area is a kind of hilly area or some sort of more mountainous area potentially. Um, and then here we've got the public walking at this level and this has been carved out of the, uh, the ground itself. So similar to the way we hid the um, keep a area back there and cut out the, uh, the the corner of that terrain here we've done it with an enclosure um, so this can also be kind of nice for animals who might want some more privacy um, on cover and screening and things like that and, and a bit more of a sheltered area if you've got this kind of dugout um, aspect obviously bigger than this but um, if you have got this provides an element of windbreak and shelter and uh, yeah protection um, as I said, and of course we've got Mr. Bongo in there, who uh, is with us every episode. So, um, next we have got elevated front to back, which I've missed the uh, the D off because I was supposed to say elevated. So, um, this is 
a very rough <laughs> view of it. So giving it basically a different perspective of an animal, so the animal being above the visitor. Um, so it's quite a useful technique if you do have a hill um, somewhere you can use this to blend um, into the, the terrain on a hill so um, if your public are walking down here and you've got a big hill here you can you can have an enclosure that goes up the hill um, and people will be able to see uh, see the animal there on the hill um, it provides quite good visibility for the animals a lot of the time because um, they are above the people so um, especially if you have a slightly lower barrier or if you have a ha-ha or something as well then um, your public aren't going to have to look through barriers and they'll be able to see them quite well um, and uh, this kind of links to the next one which is elevated back to front so obviously back to front as in the direction of elevation upwards so um, in this one here we have got a low area at the back and then uh, the kind of visitor area uh, visitor level sorry at the front so um, this is kind of maybe where you'd want to build onto existing terrain if you just had a slope that went down you could build an enclosure here um, sometimes probably won't provide as, as good views of the animals depending on the species of course um, if it's something little that can hide down in the corner there then you won't see it very well but if it's something big it might be better um, and this might be one where you'd want to incorporate elevated viewing as well into this so um, you might want to have elevated viewing going over the top of it or you might want a path on that side um, so it's effectively a, ha a very very deep ha ha but um, yeah that is uh, that is elevated back to front um, maybe not the most useful but still an option um, for your zoo depending if you have this kind of elevation there next we have hills so similar to the uh, the elevated front to back there with the bison on it um, this provides quite good views of the animals um, depending on where your paths are of course if you have paths all the way round then it will if you have path on one side you obviously won't be able to get a very good view there unless our llama makes it all the way to the top of the hill and we can see them looking majestic up there um, so often it might be used for mountainous animals so things like the llama um, but it might just be that you have existing terrain that's like this and you want to make an enclosure of it make a feature of it um, and it could just be a feature not linked to the biome so you might have um, an animal that doesn't naturally live on large mountains and hills but you've got a hill there and you want to um, exploit it for a certain species then that would uh, then that would work as well next we have variation so this is just a general note here um, so overall as long as you have variation in your zoo then it will probably look relatively realistic um, so you you will kind of want variation within the within the enclosures that you've got in your zoo as well as the actual zoo itself as we've discussed um, you may have certain areas that are kind of grouped with uh, with particular sort of ones of these so if you had a big hill as I said you might have various enclosures that all have this kind of sloped upwards thing all the way around the hill and that sort of thing um, then uh, you will probably yeah just want to use different aspects you might want to just just make a lot of enclosures it's just ever so slightly varied with the roughen tool um, things like that um, you you don't want as I said at the beginning a huge amount of flat areas some areas are fine to be flat especially if you've got large plazas and things like that but a lot of the time as I said things aren't gonna always be flat so if you can try and just get a bit of variation in your enclosures don't just have every single enclosure completely flat and that's it um, try and have some slopes and things like that it's it can be tricky trying to incorporate it and definitely will affect the way that you, the order in which you do things because that can be a little bit confusing at times trying to rework things to suit the terrain so sometimes it's best to sort terrain all out before you really get into the build um, but those are 
a few of the techniques. Not a hugely long episode this one, I don't think, um, although I might have been talking for longer than I think. Um, so yeah, hopefully some of that has been useful and hopefully I've covered everything that I needed to, but I, uh, I often think I'm going to end up forgetting something and thinking about it afterwards. Um, so what we will do now, as I do in each episode, is go over to my Whipsnade Zoo recreation that I've been doing. Um, and we will just have a look at a few examples very quickly of some of these techniques being used in a real zoo. So I will see you over there now. Okay, so we are here in my Whipsnade Zoo recreation. If you haven't already seen any of it, then um, if you check out the series it is on my channel on here as well. So um, there is a whole series, quite a few episodes now, on uh, me building this. So first one we'll look at is down here. So this is the hippo enclosure. So we've got the common hippos and the pygmy hippos over here. So this is just an example here, as in the thumbnail for the video, of um, an enclosure that slopes from front to back. Um, so you kind of get a better view of the animals wherever they are in the enclosure because the, uh, the enclosure slopes and obviously drainage wise that's kind of important as well in some areas to have slopes. So that is um, the, the hippo enclosure. If we come back out and come over this way we have the old red river hog enclosure which doesn't have uh, any red river hogs in anymore but um, this is one that I wanted to show for terrain painting so you can see we've got some patches of longer grass here with some foliage as well we have got um, a few rocks dotted about as well in here and tree stumps and things we've also got some patches of soil and some kind of um, walkways and things um, around there and then in this part of the enclosure where it's a bit more sort of wooded um, we have got mostly just soil, just the odd um, patches of longer grass and shorter grass in there as well. Um, if we come on this side, we can see an example of the Ha Ha, um, which we have quite a lot of whips made. Um, so you can see there, the path is in line with the top of like the, the standard elevation of the enclosure itself. Um, it's a bit tricky to make work with the terrain tools in the game um, because it should be a nice clean uh, flat surface along there but it's not the end of the world from, uh, from this point of view um, and you can see there we've got a little hill as well um, which has a, um, a small viewing area on it as well to provide a different um, viewpoint for visitors um, being a bit higher up if we come down this way, we can see the Gowra and Nilgai enclosures. So this is just an example of natural um, variation, undulation in the, in enclosures. So we've got some kind of slopes, we've got a small hill, um, the whole enclosure kind of slopes gradually down this way and then back up again. Just um, some variety in the amount of uh, of elevation we have and again same on this side sloping slightly down some natural bumps and curves and things like that in here and then last but not least um, we'll come on this side and this is an example of some rock work so um, this whole lake is lined with uh, with rocks and things like that so we have used the temple rubble here in rocks um, in place of rocks um, which work very well um, but we could have used normal rock pieces but these ones work quite nicely to line them so they're kind of a feature in here but just an example there of how we can use the rocks um, in the game so um, that is that is it for my examples uh, obviously the whole zoo has still got a lot to do so hopefully in future episodes I'll have future episodes I'll have a few more examples um, but yeah, that is it for now. So if you liked the video, please leave a like. Um, comment if you have any thoughts, questions, um, suggestions of what you'd like to see next. Um, and of course, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to the channel. And 
uh, you can get updates on what I'm doing, you can see new videos as soon as they come out and get notifications for them, um, and yeah, just generally see everything else that I'm uh, I'm busy being uh, creative and doing. Um, so you can also join the Discord. I have a Discord server, so if you're interested in talking about Planet Zoo, you can ask more questions and things on there, share things that you've made, all of that sort of stuff, then uh, you can join our lovely Discord community. And if you're interested in watching me build some stuff live rather than, or in addition to seeing me make videos and stuff that I've made, um, then check out my Twitch channel where you can see me do live streams um, relatively regularly on there. So thank you all for watching. If you would like to um, vote for the next topic for Planet Zookeeper as well, then that is something that you can do on the Discord. So uh, so hop in the Discord and join there and then on the voting channel there you will be able to vote for the next one when I post it on there. So thank you all very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed and hopefully I will see you all in the next one.